So a warm welcome again to you on this Mother's Day Sunday. We're so glad you're here as we continue um, our celebration of God's presence in our lives, God's call on our hearts to love him fully and to serve others with boldness and to build sacred community as followers of Jesus. So we welcome you and are so glad you're here. Today we do a kind of look at this uh, passage about Lydia and who she was for the early church, but we also look at her story to speak into our lives and how we will live out our faith uh, in ways that transform the lives of others. So will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this uh, spring day. We thank you for the presence of so many among us as we gather as sacred community, the church. We pray, God, that you would uh, bless us as we've already heard the word sung and read and, and prayed, and now, Lord, we open to hear it more deeply for ourselves and for our lives. Bless us and open our hearts to hear your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So my first year in seminary at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, I I put myself through seminary, so I took several jobs. I worked in a daycare center. I did some work at the seminary. But I took a job at the main library at SMU. And I thought it was going to be a job of reference desk, which I thought would be fun. I'd I'd encounter other people. I'd be able to help them find things. But I, I got assigned to development, which then sounded kind of fun, like maybe purchasing books and creating book lists. But really what it was was taking all the books people donated and making sure we weren't duplicating and then putting them in the book sale bin. So it was quite a glamorous job, right? Uh, I I was grateful for the job. It paid well, uh, but it had very little encounter with people. So you can imagine I got kind of lonely up in the stacks kind of checking things out, and especially in the basement of the library. But I did that for a year along with a number of other jobs, and and I realized I just sensed that uh, I was not really happy there. And so as the summer began, the spring was ending, I was out at the common table eating breakfast, and someone I knew from down the hall announced that she had been working in this church uh, on the southeast side of Dallas in a small suburb, really out in the country, and that she had been their youth pastor, but she decided that you know she, it wasn't for her that she needed to do something different, and she was giving it up. And she said, are you interested? And as she talked to me, it was a very small church and this kind of a town along the river bottom, and uh, there, she said, they're always struggling with paying my salary, and I'm, I didn't get paid several times, and I thought, well, this is real convincing, amen, right? <laughs> uh, and so I said, probably not, right? But it's one of those things where um, I just wrestled with it. Like, I thought, this sounds like an opportunity, and, and I would think about it, and I, would, I, I think God would prompt me about it, and I called my dad and mom about it, and my dad said, well, that's ridiculous. You're not going to go into that kind of situation, And he said, it doesn't make sense. And I knew in my head that the library made sense. On campus, flexible hours, good pay. I even had benefits. Uh, And then my heart said, well, maybe, maybe this is where you should be. And I talked to a bunch of friends, and, you know, nothing made sense. But in the end, I took the job, right? And even the librarian said, are you crazy? This is a job people want. And I said, I know it. It makes sense, but it doesn't, right? And so I went to this little church in Seagoville, Texas, as their youth pastor. And the pastor was kind of odd and strange, and uh, it, it was a very interesting staff. It was very small. Um, it was just a different, and the whole time I'm thinking, have I made a mistake, you know? And maybe you've been in that place before. But then I met a woman named Ozella Stark. That yeah, sounds very Texas, right? Uh, Ozella Stark, and she was in her 80s. And she said, we're so glad you're here, and we're, we're so thankful that you're present. And And then Ozella took me to lunch, and then she invited me to her house periodically, and she encouraged me, and she'd stop by when I was at the church, and she had all of this stuff. And as we began to get to know one another, she said, well, you know that another person from Lubbock, Texas was here, and she called the name of a guy that had been their youth pastor, who had been my pastor, and so I called him, and we had all these interesting connections. So it began to make sense that maybe, though it didn't make sense, it did make sense. Ozella was... uh, a matriarch in the church. She was a gentle spirit, but she was a very profound leader. And even in her 80s, people really turned to her for wisdom and understanding. And she just constantly provided me with food. When I didn't want to have to drive all the way back to the seminary because I had something at night, I could stay at her house. She was just that kind of person. When the year ended and I had to go to a full-time internship, I had to leave Segaville. And I learned from the church council chair that the reason my salary had been paid through the whole year was because Ozella Stark filled in the gap every week. Yeah. That was shocking to me. 
I was amazed that this woman, single, small house in Seagoville, Texas, made sure that I was able to stay and be in ministry in that place for a year. She wasn't known in wide circles. She wasn't known probably beyond our church in this small community. But she had a profound impact on that church and on many people, including my pastor when I was in college, and on my life as well. So when Lydia gets lifted up, it's not a lot of verses, friends. I mean, Lydia doesn't get a lot of uh, coverage. We know a lot more about Eve and Miriam, and we know a lot about Deborah and her grandstand in a war conflict. And we even know a little bit more about Mary, of course, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and some other important people, even nameless people like the woman at the well. Lydia just gets a few verses in the book of Acts. Let's go on the backstory just to see how do we come to encounter Lydia and who is she? Paul, you know Paul, St. Paul, pretty well known, right? He and some companions had decided it was time to travel again on a mission journey, and uh, he felt a deep call to go to Asia. He said that he felt that that's where God wanted him to be, and he was going to Asia. And in the verses prior to today's reading, Paul is determined to take his team to Asia to share the good news of Jesus. But as you may know from this story, uh, he has several promptings by the Spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to say, no, Paul, you can't go there. No, Paul, you can't go there. It made sense. Asia was amazing. The markets in Asia were unbelievable. The cities were large, and he had this whole base in Asia Minor. It was the practical, logical place to launch more ministry. Amen? But the Spirit said no. And in fact, in a dream one night prior to today's reading, uh, Paul has a dream of a man standing in Macedonia saying, please come help us. Now Macedonia is a territory, it's a country today. It's just north of Greece, uh, and uh, it, Macedonia is a small kind of unknown region. It was Europe, that's not where Paul wanted to go. It was not a place he felt called to. It didn't make sense, but the Spirit said it does. And so after the dream, Paul says to his team, I know we've geared toward Asia, we've learned all the languages, we've done all the training, we've done all the demographic studies, but we're not going to Asia, right? We're going to go to Macedonia. And so they enter Macedonia, and there's a whole, you can just look at the verses prior to today and see their whole journey across the Aegean Sea, but they end up in the city of Philippi. Now, Philippi was a large city. It was located in the province of Macedonia in the Roman Empire. It had been named for Alexander the Great's father, Philip, and it was uh, an amazing city, multiple people, multiple religions. Uh, it was a, a major stop on the Ignatian Way, so it was a huge trade and business and political route. There were Roman garrisons there, and it was an official Roman colony. So it was full of Roman soldier veterans who, in, in payment for their service, were given land grants, and they relocated uh, from Rome and Italy to Philippi. It was, a, it was a very vibrant city. And it's to this city that Paul goes. And we learn from today's readings that they sailed from Troas, straight from Samothrace. They ended up in Philippi, a city of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and they stayed in the city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the riverbank. Now, if you've done any study of Paul's mission journeys, often when he enters a community, he goes straight to the synagogue on the Sabbath, right? You know, the synagogue, the place of worship for Jews that kind of emerged out of the exile. It was a place of prayer and worship and community. And he would go there because he, he knew the synagogue. You know, he was a rabbi. He knew that was a great place to begin. That's where folks would be open to hear, right? It made sense to go to the synagogue. But for whatever reason, Philippi doesn't have a synagogue. Now, I didn't know this until recently, that to have an official synagogue, you have to have 10 Jewish men, right? And then if there are 10 men, you then have an official synagogue, right? So you can have all the women and children in the world, but until there are 10 men, uh, you can't have a synagogue. I don't know if that's true in Reform, but that's uh, uh, kind of an ancient practice. So apparently there weren't 10 Jewish men in Philippi who were faithful. I don't know, right? But whatever the case, there seems to not be a synagogue in Philippi. So Paul knows from his own experience that sometimes Jews would gather on the Sabbath if there wasn't a synagogue along the riverbank. And so there was a great river that flowed through the city of Philippi. And Scripture tells us in verse 12 and 13 forward that on the Sabbath they went outside of the city gate to the riverbank where they thought there might be a place of prayer. And there was. 
And we sat down and we began to talk with the women who had gathered. So it sounds like it's a gathering of women, maybe a few men there, but not 10, obviously. One of those women was Lydia. And Lydia was a Gentile God worshiper from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. Now that's probably the most information we'll learn about Lydia. Now over the centuries, we've said Lydia was her first name, and that very well may be true. But Thyatira, the city, list, existed in a place called, a region called Lydia that had been an ancient uh, small empire during the Iron Age. So it could be translated a Lydian woman, right? But through the centuries, we've called her Lydia, so for the sake of that, we'll call her Lydia. She now lived in Philippi, but she was originally from Thyatira, which was a city in Asia Minor. And Thyatira was along a series of tributaries of water that were perfect for dyeing cloth. The water just made it work well. There was a sense of roots and so forth there that they could create a juice that allowed them in Thyatira uh, to create a beautiful purple cloth. Remember, during those days, there were no chemical dyes and you know, all that kind of stuff. It was all natural. And so Thyatira, for some reason, was a perfect location for the making of purple cloth. And you're like, okay, James, why are we talking about this? This seems unimportant. Amen? Right? I know what you're saying, right? I can go to Joanna's Fabric and take care of this, right? <laughs> but the point is, in the ancient world, dyed cloth was very rare, and especially purple cloth. And purple cloth was of great value because the empire and the wealthy purchased it. It was a major color in Roman outfits and could be shaded in different ways, even to red. And so you can see that the fabric from Thyatira was very important. And we know from excavations and history that there were guilds of purple dyeing cloth folks and unions of purple dyeing cloth folks. And so it was a very important trade. And because of its great value, people who dealt in purple cloth often had economic stability and strength. So that gives us a word about Lydia. She was a Gentile God worshiper, so she was not a Jew. She was like several Gentiles during this period who were enthralled with this one God concept from Judaism and who went and worshiped, but she clearly had not yet or planned to convert. And she was a dealer in purple cloth, and so therefore she had to have some economic stability. As she listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message, the good news of Jesus. And then immediately, we don't get a real sense of how that worked, or what worship service, or what song they sang, or did she, how did it all turn out. It's just in the next verse, in 15, once Lydia and her household were baptized, okay, all right, right? She heard the message of Jesus. She heard the good news of Jesus. She immediately made a commitment, and we don't know exactly what happened, but clearly she went to her household, and maybe Paul went with her, and, or maybe whatever, and they shared the good news, and then all of a sudden this whole group of people, Gentiles, uh, are baptized and convert to follow Jesus. And, and in, the, in the Greek language, household includes children, and it includes servants, and so it could be this whole group of people. So Lydia is not only someone who brings her own household to the faith of Christ, but this is important. She's the first convert to Christianity in Europe, okay? She's the first convert to Christianity in Europe. And then she says this to them after her baptism. Now that you've decided that I'm a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she persuaded us to stay. So it tells us a little bit about Lydia. It doesn't seem like she's married because then she wouldn't be the head of her household, right? So some people think maybe she's widowed, and some people think maybe uh, she's divorced. We don't know that. We, we think one or the other. But what we do know that she is the head of the household, that in some way she now has children and a family, and she's in charge of them, and therefore she has brought them into this fold, and at least she has some sense of a building or a house that allows for a larger group to, to stay because she invites all of Paul's entourage to stay with them. And that's kind of a risky business, you know, a single woman with a family inviting all these guys to stay, you know what I'm saying? So actually Lydia puts herself a little bit at risk, and they take a little risk, but she's so persuasive uh, to bring them in. And, and then there's belief in the early church from its traditions that Lydia helped, along with others, to fund the mission journeys of Paul and that she was a key leader in the Philippian church. And though her name is not specifically listed in the first chapter of Philippians, it's, it, it's indicative that she's kind of alluded to as one of the key leaders in that early church in Philippi. So it, it's, I think it's an amazing story about this woman who has wisdom and strength, who's a capable businesswoman, 
who has made something of herself and her family, who has these connections to royalty and, and uh, people of prominence, and yet gathers with Jewish women on a riverbank to pray. Do you see what I'm saying? who's seeking and longing to learn something that would change her life and to hear a word of good news. And then Paul shows up, and immediately this woman, who has a lot on her side, decides to make this complete embrace and bring her family to this relationship with Jesus, and then ultimately to be a supporter of Paul. In fact, in the next chapter, Paul gets in trouble, you may remember, as he frees a slave girl from a demon. He's imprisoned, and when he gets out of prison with all the rest of they come and stay at Lydia's house where she nurtures them and heals and brings care to them. So Lydia gives us an example of strength and power. So what does this story say into our lives? Well, I think it, it's a good story about how Christianity came to Europe. I think it's a powerful story about how the good news of Jesus transforms lives, especially for those seeking. But what I really like about this story is that it's the unlikely place where the message is spoken and the relationship is made and the life is changed, right? It should have happened in a synagogue, or it should have happened at a religious festival, but it happens on a riverbank in a small prayer meeting of women in a common place that most folks would not see as anything of great value. Amen? And so then it challenges me to think about the way I live and share the faith of Jesus, and when those opportunities that don't make sense make sense. You know what I'm saying? That it's not the library, it's the country church. It's not the sanctuary, it's the Starbucks. It's not, you see what I'm saying? Paul and his followers go to this place that's so unassuming and it makes no sense. And it's there that they have this major and beautiful and life-changing encounter with a woman named Lydia who is not Jewish and is not in a synagogue and isn't even married. And all of these things that everyone would say, that doesn't make sense, but it does. About two weeks ago, I wrote about this this week in my devotion. I went for my annual physical at the doctor, which I hate, right? Anybody else feel that way? <laughs> Can't sleep the night before, you know, drink water and vegetables as if that's going to make a difference on the tests, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You know what I'm talking about. So, I, you know, you, I, I'm dreading it. And I get into the room, and of course, they say, Dr. Lou's running late today. I mean, we hear that all the time, right? And I go, oh, great. And so I'm sitting there kind of sweating bullets, and they take the blood pressure. Oh, it's normal. Then they say some other things. And Samantha comes in, who's the head nurse in this doctor's office. And so I see the doctor. She and I are talking in between the visits, and she it begins to share, you know, she says, uh, my dad's in Michigan, and he lives in the UP, and he's dying of cancer, and my family's really struggling about whether to do hospice or treatment, and you know those stories. Amen, right? And she doesn't know I'm a minister, so somehow she's new to the office. She, she doesn't know that, and so she's just spelling it out. And she's saying, and you know, the church hasn't been very helpful, and the church can be a real pain in the, you know, right? <laughs> and so I'm just listening to that, trying to stay calm, because I'm about to have an EKG, right, you know? <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, yeah, it can be tough, and the church can be hypocritical, and sometimes tough, so not, things are not easy, and sometimes they're not easy solutions, and... And so she said, well, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a minister. And you could just see the shock. <laughs> Thank God she didn't have an EKG, right, you know. So then she lays me down on the examining table and begins to put the adhesive things for the EKG. Well, what do you think about my dad, you know? And what do you think I should do? And I said, well, tell me about what's going on, and I'll leave it there. We had an amazing conversation as the adhesives are coming on, right? <laughs> and as I'm laying still, she begins to share more. And really, she's needing to talk about faith and her dad's illness and the struggle and her questions and her uncertainty. And so as the thing's going on, I'm just listening because I'm not supposed to move, right? And then after it comes off, we just keep talking and we ended up praying together, right? And uh, I thought, this doesn't make sense, but it does. It does make sense. The deal is, friends, we are presented with opportunities all the time to encounter folks who are in need of the good news of Jesus. Amen? We don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to have it all together. We don't have to have every answer or have it all figured out. 
But God presents us time and time again opportunities to share the good news of Jesus. It's not a tract or it's not a hard line. It's a conversation. And sometimes people are longing for that right in our very midst. And so I, I'm challenged about that in my day-to-day life. I find that I'm often caught up in stuff that doesn't help me, right? I'm, it's minutia, you know, right? Maybe you're in minutia sometimes. Or sometimes the opportunity presents itself, and I say to myself, I don't have time. But this may be the one window, the one opportunity, the one opportunity to have this rich conversation, to pray with someone, to connect with someone. It happens all the time here in our ministries, at the food pantry, in our thrift store, in pads, all of these places we encounter folks. But in your day-to-day work and life, amen? Shelley Leonida and I met this week because I feel a deep call, and she does as well, and some of you will follow and connect with that too, that just down the road, they're building 200 condo units in Wheeling to build a downtown, right? And I I drive by that space every day wondering, who will live there? Who will raise their children there? Who will be in ministry there? What will happen there? Who will go to the train station there? And I wonder, and I know, that I need to spend more time there than here. Amen? It doesn't make sense, but it does. And so I challenge us to think about where the people are in our community and in our lives, in our workplaces, that need us to take the time to be in relationship. Not for a new number on our list, not for a great statistical report at the end of the year, but so that somebody can hear the good news that in the midst of their struggle, their questions, their uncertainty, their doubts, or whatever it may be, Jesus is present and loves them deeply. Amen? It doesn't make sense, but it does. And so for Lydia and Paul and all the gang gathered at the river, I give thanks because they remind me that the opportunity presents itself all the time. So today is Mother's Day, and we welcome all who are mothers and like mothers and families and guests who are with us. But let us enter now into a special time of prayer for Mother's Day. Will you pray with me? O holy God, for our mothers who have given us life and love, that we might show them honor and reverence and grace and celebration We pray to you, O God. For mothers in our midst and in our community and beyond who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends and the church will support, console, and strengthen them. We pray to you, O God. For women, though without children of their own, who, like mothers, have nurtured and cared for so many of us. We pray to you, O God. For mothers and families and children who struggle even on this day to make ends meet, for those mothers who work so hard and diligently to provide for their children, we pray for healing and abundance. We pray to you, O God. And God, we pray for mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children, and who have not sustained their families. We pray to you, O God. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you too watch over your church and your people. As Lydia led and provided in beautiful ways for the early church and the sharing of the gospel, may we be open to those times 
where we share our gifts as well. Bless all the women we've mentioned in our hearts and in prayer that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and their love shine forth and grant that we, their sons and their daughters, their friends, their fellow travelers in faith, may honor them as a sign of your grace and your extreme joy. We pray that you would grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so as soon as you walk outside these doors, you'll encounter folks. Amen? Amen. Walker Brothers, Starbucks, neighbor, <laughs> person at work tomorrow. And it won't, it won't make sense, but it will. Open your heart. Open our minds. Let the Holy Spirit guide us, because Lydia may be right there to hear. Amen.